it was our first date that we talked about a lot of things that people don't typically talk about on their first date. One of those things was, you know, how many kids do you want? <laughs> and so naturally that conversation evolved into, oh, I was thinking it someday, I'd like to foster. Oh, I was thinking of something. I'd like to foster. Oh, I'd like to adopt. Oh, I'd like to adopt. Uh, we kind of thought, like Josh said, that we would maybe adopt someday after having some biological children. Um, but we started trying to get pregnant, and after a year, it didn't happen. Um, so we saw a fertility specialist, and we had, you know, some ideas about the treatments that we wanted to do, the ones we probably wouldn't do at that point. So we said, we're not going to do IVF just because it's so expensive and it's a risk. Um, we were diagnosed with unexplained infertility, so they couldn't tell us why nothing was happening. So um, we decided to do a few rounds of like IUI. Um, and when those treatments failed, um, we, I think it was our final round of treatments. Um, and that morning, the day that we were going to find out if it had worked or not with blood work, um, that morning Josh drove to work in the city and saw a, a billboard that said, become a foster parent today. Um, it was a brand new billboard. It wasn't up the previous day when he drove to work. Um, so uh, he called me and said, listen, I think this is what we have to do. And I had gotten the news that we weren't pregnant and that it, the treatments didn't work. So. Um, it kind of felt like a sign. It kind of felt like the right timing. So we... All our major life decisions are guided by billboard advertisements. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not always that smack you in the face kind of obvious, like what the next step is. But um, it was something we'd kind of been discussing and we have uh, friends and family who have fostered. Hmm. Um, so we were aware of the need and um, yeah, so we... We um, basically signed up uh, for the orientation. We said, you know, we're just going to go to this meeting. We're just going to see what we think. It's just an informational meeting. And we pretty quickly decided we were going to foster after that. So that threw us into a whole other journey. Um, but basically, we were foster parents for one year. We had twin toddlers, boys, in our house for five to six months. Mm -hmm. Um, they lived with us. We adore them. We still do. Um, we're blessed that they're still in our lives. But I think it was the second day they um, were placed with us. It was like the, they came to us at like 7 p.m. Um, with nothing but a piece of paper that said their names and their birthday. So the next morning, you know, we're getting to know them and we went somewhere. Um, I think it was that morning we were getting in the car to go somewhere, maybe a doctor's appointment. You have to go to a lot of appointments. Um, so we were in the car and I remember just looking at Josh with tears in my eyes saying, you know, there was always a little part of me that wondered if I could, if I could love someone else's child the way I could, I could love maybe my own someday. And the second morning we had them, I just looked at him and said, I want to adopt. Like, we can do this. I can love any, any child as much as I would love, like a child that was biologically ours. So, um, that, I think, is when like the the words that we had spoken and the the dreams that we had discussed really became hmm. planted in my heart. I knew after that that I wanted to adopt. Hmm. Um, and yeah, the twins were with us a few months, um, just about half a year, and they were reunited with their birth mother, um, who is a wonderful, really hardworking woman with a lot on her plate. So um, they're with her still which we are, you know, we're so excited for her that they get to be together. We're so excited for them that they get to be with all their siblings. Um, but um, after they went home, we definitely felt the void. Of, like, we were just parents. We, used, we were just buying go-gurts, and now we're like, have no plans on a Friday night. But then we decided, um, like, after the foster sons left, we were like, we need permanence. We believe in foster care we appreciate it we see the need for it the kids are so worth it but we need some we need somebody who's not going to leave our house so um, after that we decided that we would start pursuing adoption mm -hmm. 
And I think it was um, right at the start of COVID. No, it was the week that the twins left. I called our agency and said, um, I know people who have adopted through you before. Um, and they had a really good experience. Is there any way we could get information about that? And they said, we're currently not doing adoptions. We, we're not accepting new families. We could put you on a wait list. So that was like 2019, I think, we called them. Yeah, it, um, maybe even before. Yeah. Yeah, they've been 2018. Because I think we're on the wait list for th almost three years. Yeah. I don't remember exactly when, but we got put on the wait list there. They said, we're not accepting new parents. We're not sure when we will. Um, and so we were kind of discouraged by that. We spent some time um, looking at a lot of looking other, at other agencies. We yeah. researched, I mean, international, international adoption. Uh, local adoption. Local, yeah, like kind of looking at our options. It's very overwhelming. We had forgot, <laughs> we, had forgot we were doing so much research that we had forgotten that we were on a wait list. So after many, many... We phone know. calls, meetings, agency reviews later, you got a phone call. Yeah, we were we had narrowed it down to two agencies that we thought we might use. We were looking at international adoption with Columbia and um, another um, kind of like private agency out of state. And we just couldn't agree. We like <laughs> could not, like the two of us were divided and there were things about the international adoption we thought might not work for us, might not be the best fit, and um, couldn't agree with everything from the other agency. And we, I remember we were just kind of at wit's end. We're like, well, if we can't figure, like this is a big decision. We have to be on the same page. And that's when we got the phone call from our agency in Syracuse, New York. And they said, hey, you're on a wait list here and we're accepting new parents. We're getting ready to train them and get them approved. So are you ready to do this? <laughs> I do think that we were able to meet most of those concerns pretty readily in our hearts, partially because like you said, that there's the heart of the father and the heart of the mother. That's not always contingent on the fruit of your womb, right? And that's what we learned is that we had such a love for people in general and to see them grow up into the best version possible of themselves, whether they were, you know, 18 months or all the college kids we had when we were involved with the college ministry, you know, here at Calvary, there was, there's this, this just longing to see children or younger people go out into the world and to embrace it with bravery and courage and love and good virtues and those sort of things, right? And also this this hospitality and this willingness to open them up, you know, open arms back up and let them in, you know, have a place to eat a hot meal, cry, like that's always been in our hearts. And so we realize that that's why we're open to fostering, that's why we're open to adoption is that we've just had that heart for a long time. And I think that gives you a sense of confidence, or at least I feel like it gave us a sense of confidence that no matter our shortcomings, like we're committed, right? And it's embracing, it's embracing like that, I guess that commitment piece past or beyond the shortcomings that we could see ourselves having that propels a parent to love anyways. I think logistically, just love like a it. really obvious one is that financially, we were kind of scared to jump into this. Mm, that's <laughs> there a good were, point. Um, you know, that. we knew we had, we had people who were approaching us. Like we would help you fundraise if this was ever something you wanted, you know, years prior, people were approaching us saying, you know, if you ever choose to adopt, let us know we want to back you. Um, so we knew there was some community support, but we just, I mean, you just don't know. You don't ask people right then, like, like okay, oh. how much do you support me? <laughs> well, what would that dollar amount Here's be? A, yeah. <laughs> so, We're like, not running a K-Love pledge. We like, knew. Line, so we don't really know. <laughs> we knew that people, like, were behind us and would support us, but yeah. we didn't know how far, we didn't know how much, and we had, you know, we had some personal savings that we had set aside for this, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough, and mm -hmm. um, 
And so the reality was we were unsure of what that would look like. We jumped in, not knowing how long it might take us to meet our financial goals. Once we were approved as foster parents, or sorry, once we were approved as adoptive parents and our home was opened, um, that's when we started all the fundraising. That's when we announced um, we didn't want people giving us money if we weren't going to pass the process. So, um, but yeah, so once we were approved, we started fundraising and it could have, you know, we could have, like that could have taken a really long time and we could have had to wait um, until we were able to save more or we were able to fundraise more. Um, but because of the generosity of the people around us, we were completely funded, I think, within a month. Um, we were met about half our goal just organically with friends mm -hmm. and family approaching us. And then I think we were still about maybe 10,000 shy. <laughs> we were still about halfway there. And, um, and one of my friends started a GoFundMe and we, within... I think three days we were like completely funded. Yeah, we'd hit, um, I think we had hit like a, a plateau of like people that knew our story and that knew, and you know, we, we weren't advertising or putting up billboards, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, we had hit that plateau, but thankfully other people took it upon themselves to, I guess, call for more generosity. And yeah. that came through. We're really grateful. Yeah. It's the most humbling. Honestly, that was one of the hardest parts for us, I think, was receiving mm. all the help. Um, it's really humbling to receive that amount of money. Like, just, mm. like, there were really big checks and there were really small checks. It didn't matter. It always felt like just it blew us away that people were so committed to seeing, yeah. to seeing a family built in our home. Um, and I... I think that some people, you know, loved us and wanted to see us happy. And some people believe in the mission of adoption and knew mm -hmm. maybe this isn't for me, but this is something I want to give toward. Um, and it was just really humbling to be on the mm. receiving end of both of those scenarios. Um, but yeah, I think that was one of the hardest things, honestly, was receiving. Um, we're so grateful and we've had a lot of practice in receiving <laughs> As yeah. some people know, we were the squirrel family, kicked out of our home by squirrels, and um, and a lot of people donated to us so that we could move back into our house by Christmas. So it's not <laughs> our, it wasn't our first GoFundMe, <laughs> but it's it's very humbling all the same. <laughs> yes. Nor did we set up that GoFundMe again. No. Thanks. We're not self-made people, uh, though we were trained to be. Mm -hmm. Right. So really, what we've discovered through we discovered the same lesson in a different light through our adoption journey in that you know you're really here on earth as a part of a family like, and that's probably the power of of adoption in, in one sense is that someone else sees your life and your need and they take it upon themselves as of utmost importance and it's weird because in some way, like a lot of people, the one thing that they said the most of is, I just want to be a part of your story and they would give according to that. That's a really humbling thing. There's something so compelling about it that people were like, I, I want to contribute and be a part of that, which is an interesting thing, I think, for at least in our experience. I can't speak for everyone, but typically families are created in a very uh, closed environment, right? <laughs> and the reality is that you don't usually need other people's help. It kind of happens naturally. Um, but the humbling piece is that now you need other people's help, typically. You know, not always, but a lot of people do need other people's help, and that's a very humbling thing. And it feels, it feels different, but then you realize that that's really like the truest how do I say this other than then the effort the community effort to birth a family like adoption is a really beautiful thing and I think some of the healthiest families I see have that connection to a broader community and so it's interesting that kids grow really healthy and really well when they're in a family that's deeply and widely connected to a community even outside their own, you know, nuclear family. 
So how great is it that even the genesis of the, or like the, the formation of the family happens with that community? That's typically something that does happen, you know, by the way that a community pours love into the couple, right, and supports them and says, you guys will be great parents, so you, you're totally ready for this. Like that stuff happens. But then when it happens in like with checks and, you know, Venmo transfers, like there's some tangible... There's something very tangible to show the community support. I'm probably not explaining that the best way possible, yeah, like but yeah. it, it, for us, it was a shift in mentality. It's like, oh, this is this is what healthy community looks like, mm -hmm. and there's no mm -hmm. reason to have shame or a sense of we didn't try hard enough or that we couldn't produce. And so that's mm -hmm. one of the things that we overcame. I saw Olivia grow tremendously in her hope. Move from a concept to a reality of life, from a concept of oh, this 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 abstract feeling that something will work out good, right? That I'm supposed to have, to the reality of this is how I live my life, and that's a powerful transition for a child of God to make, because Paul says in these three things abide: faith, hope, and love, right? And we're like, oh yeah, great, yeah. We usually say, oh yeah, and agree with that because we hear the word love. We don't really associate the reality that hope is this. It's this wild thing that you can't be in a hopeful situation immediately and have hope. It's not a learned, it's, it's not a like, that's a learned response, right? That's eyes that see something that, that hasn't yet come to pass. You know, you're, you're counting on the faithfulness of God. Uh, and sometimes you're counting on him for faithfulness for things that you don't know that he has done, right? Like you hear stories maybe, or you can imagine stories where God has done this for somebody. We can find them in scripture, you know. Uh, but for us in our everyday lives, sometimes it was really difficult to see, well, will God really give us a child, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, will this actually happen? Because we've, we ran into enough in all the favor that we had with people advocating for us and championing us. We also had some wild obstacles you know we don't have time to go into all those today but there was enough obstacles for us to look at each other sometimes and be like what are we doing wrong <laughs> like if if we're, if we're if we're meant to do this how come it hasn't happened right even with the adoption process you know moving through that the better part of five years right like just didn't come easy it was very expensive you know, a lot of the other agencies had uh, requirements that we couldn't meet. And it was like, wow, this seems insurmountably hard. <laughs> and so having the hope that it'll happen a month later is one thing. Having a month pass by, Olivia was like, oh, okay, this is not cool. Two months, six months, eight months, nine months, ten months, one year, two year, three year, four year, five year, six year, seven year, right? No, and it's just six not years. not quite. Yes, yeah, just <laughs> six years, right? Well, we're still waiting. We're you know we, we still want to have uh, you know a biological child. That, that desire hasn't gone anywhere, right? I would say mm -hmm. that that's true. It's like you have so much love to give, right? Uh, that that adopting is a beautiful thing, but it's it's its own thing, right? And, mm -hmm. and it's an important thing to recognize that. Mm -hmm. So they're still waiting. But who she is now and how she handles the possibility that it could be another seven years. Seven years ago, that would have broken Olivia. You know, She thought it was maybe only going to be a year, maybe only two years. So her ability to hope and trust that God does work out things has really grown. Mm -hmm. Part of it because you have seen his faithfulness over the seven years. Six years. Six years, right. After our foster sons left our home, we were devastated. And after a few months um, of very little contact, we were able to see them on their second birthday. Um, and then after that, we kind of became a resource to their mother and were able to stay in their lives. And we got to see them grow, we got to hold them, we got to hug them, we got to feed them their favorite fruits and goodies at our house. And it was just that to me was proof that God cared. And I think um, in the hardest season of our lives to date at that point, um, God showed up 
and built a bridge between what we thought would happen and what actually happened. Mm. And, um, and after that, I started to see how maybe our infertility was part of a bigger story. Mm. And um, I kept referring to his goodness with the twins. I kept reminding myself that he was there. And, um, and that was a really helpful reminder in the, in the next three years while we waited for Ariana, um, proof that those, those two curly headed little boys, <laughs> they wouldn't have been in our life if we had gotten pregnant right away. And, um, we get to see them this weekend too. Yeah, tomorrow. <laughs> I'm just we'll take them to the zoo tomorrow. Really excited to see them, but um, like it's just I remember them playing at our house for the first time after they went home to their mother, and there was a psalm um, that said, "Oh, what's the one about the fortunes return to the, the Negev or something?" You know which one I'm, I believe you. <laughs> I feel like it's like I don't remember if it's Psalm 137, but there was a psalm that just brought me a lot of comfort, and it was, and I wasn't sure what that psalm meant when I woke up that morning. But through the throughout the course of the day, the twins ended up at our house, and that was the first time they'd been back. And mm -hmm. then I understood the psalm I had read that morning, and I've just reminded myself that that God has proved himself faithful. He was there. He, and, and as much as I didn't understand and didn't enjoy the years of infertility leading up to the twins or the years of infertility infer from the twins until Ariana or the time of infertility from Ariana until now, like the, that has been a crucial part of my story in order to meet my godsons mm -hmm. and in order to have my precious daughter. And I wouldn't wish it any other way now <laughs> but there were Keyword years yeah. of wishing it another way yeah so I think that's just one of the ways I've seen God steadfastness is just he was there through it all and now I can see his his hand in all of it the effort the community effort to birth a family like adoption is a really beautiful thing and I think some of the healthiest families I see have that connection to a broader community. So how great is it that even the genesis of, or like the, the formation of a family happens with that community?